shoes on. So, um, I didn't bring any pictures or anything because it's this to me is mainly about having a conversation and an interaction with you guys. Guys meaning men, women, women, women. Um, let's see. I started getting interested in the land and growing food. Well, I guess when I was 20. I was at university in England. I'd grown up in industrial northern England, like in places where there was hardly any greenery at all. And outside town was sheep farming. So I didn't really see much like growing of produce and stuff. It was either it was either in town or sheep farming. That, that's what went on. And uh, when I was at university, I, I started to just get interested in, in food growing, and I started to make compost. I thought that was cool. Mm -hmm. I don't do that anymore. I, I did it for a long time. It's a lot of work. And, uh, and then I, I worked on some farms in England. Um, when I left university, I, I dropped out. I was doing engineering and math. And I kind of got over that. Headed for the hills and ended up working on a bunch of farms. For a while, I was a, um, what they call a relief milker. How about that? <laughs> That's somebody who goes and milks the, the, the herd of cows when the regular guy goes on vacation. Because he has to have a vacation, right? <laughs> and so I'd show up, and, and the guy, would be, he'd be there for one day with me, and you know, there'd be 60 or 80 cows, and he'd say, well, here, this is what you do. And, like, oh my gosh. <laughs> anyway, <that's, laughs> that was my introduction to farming back then. But well, let's, let's just jump ahead, way ahead, to uh, coming to Hawaii and starting to. Has, it, has anybody read Handy and Handy? Elizabeth Craig Hill Handy and, and oh, yeah. her husband? Native planters right. and older ones. Native planters. Native, Native planters, yeah. Native yeah. planters and, and their law. Yeah. Right? Well, I got that book given to me in 1980 when I arrived here. And I read it cover to cover. And then I read the section on tarot again, which was 111 pages on tarot and 80 pages on Luala. I mean, this is a book, serious. And, and I, I was like, okay. Well, it sounds like tarot's the thing. Because in England, I'd grown potatoes and stuff like that. Too. Okay, got to get the tarot going. And, uh, so I got into that early. I was making poi in the early 80s, at home with a potato masher. And, just, and then I, was, I fed it to my, I, I raised my kids on poi, on homemade poi. I remember my, my six-month-old boy sitting on my lap. And uh, um, I read in many places that carbohydrates need chewing before infants eat them, right? So I'd chew my poi and spit it on my finger and then feed it to my little boy. Because they don't have the digestive system to, to, to digest it. So, so my, my thing with taro and poi goes back a long way. And then I just had to start to realize that what's, what's going on in the, in the soil? What, what's going on in there? And for years, I just had my own ideas about it. All the creatures that are in there that are visible and invisible. You know, there's, there's all the arthropods, the beetles that are running around, and the worms, and the, um, what else is it we can see? What's in the soil that you can actually see? Worms. Fungus. <coughs> worms, uh, beetles, arthropods. Um, anything else? Algae. Fungus. Hmm? Fungus. Fungus, you can see that, yeah. Algae. Yeah. Sometimes, yeah. And then there's little springtails, right? Mm -hmm. Are they arthropods? They're not, are they? The little springtails that hop all... They are. Are they arthropods too? Mm -hmm. Right. And, and so I just realized that, wow, I've got to take care of them. I've got to take care of all that, that life. Because what's it doing? And this was just empirical in my own mind. It was before I read much on what was really going on. Now, it was like, 
Well, what, what are they doing? What are all those creatures doing? What do they do? They eat and poop. They eat, they eat, <laughs> they eat and they poo. <laughs> and and they, they, they reproduce. Yeah. And, Breathe. and they die. Right? There you go. They die. <laughs> and, and a lot of them have exoskeletons, right? And what are they? Is the is Squaritin. What are they made out of? Calcium. Is there calcium in there? Chitin and squaritin. I don't know. Is there calcium in there? <laughs> sure. I figured there must be. <laughs> so because I, a lot of people used to tell me, well, you can't you can't make calcium. You got to put it. You got to put it. You got to pour it on. You know. And I was going, well, what about all those dead things? Aren't, isn't there calcium in, in there? Where are they making it from? Because there's a lot of them in the forest, and nobody's dumping anything on that. So, you know, it's okay. There was an Indian guy, an East Indian guy, who wrote a definitive um, soil, um, a, a definitive description of Pune soils. Mm. Somebody must know. You, mean, you know the guy? Nobody's read that? Sounds vaguely familiar. Yeah. <laughs> the, 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 <laughs> what? <laughs> I read scientific papers. You can't keep track. <laughs> well, you, you, you should look that up. There's, there's, there's a, there's, this guy did a, did a in-depth um, analysis of Pune soils, and he found that the calcium levels were pretty good. Whereas a lot of people said, "No, no, you've got to put it on." Anyway, so back to what I was figuring that out now. What can I do to help all these creatures? So there's lots of them. So there's lots of eating and pooping and dying because <laughs> that's what you want to the max as, as much as you can possibly get and uh, it's, it, it's pretty obvious that what's the main enemy of that what, what stops it what stops all that life going on water, lack of water <clears throat> lack of water, wood, yes sun, sun. sun. light sun. sunlight <laughs> Green leaves just love sunlight. But all that life down in the soil that grows those green leaves? Uh-uh. Mm -mm -mm -mm. what, what do you think forest is all about? Right? What's a forest all about? It's about keeping that sun from getting down there, right? Doesn't forests do that really well? Right, so the sun can't get down there to where all that life is. And the forest keeps dropping stuff down there. And, and I used to walk in the forest a lot and just look around and go, look at this. And you poke around in there and there's all kinds of stuff going on. And uh, it's looking pretty healthy and no one's putting anything on it. Right? Is it, no one's buying bags of stuff from the mainland and putting it on the forest. It's just doing it by itself. Now, now obviously, most of the plants uh, uh, the kind of plants that don't need that much care. But still, it's kind of impressive that it's just doing its thing. And so I, I, I really took note of that. So, it, so in my gardening practices before I got into farming, just gardening on a scale like you know this room, it became obvious that my main task was to create the ideal habitat for... Now for all that life. And, and, and about that time, I came across that little pamphlet book written by, what's the name from Oregon? The, the Soil Biology Primer. Mm -hmm. What's Elaine. her name? Elaine. Mm -hmm. Elaine Ingham. Ingham. Right. Man, now that's a beautiful <laughs> little book. The Soil Biology Primer. She, and she calls it the Soil Food Web. And if you... If, if you really want to turn yourself on to really looking after the, the, the land, then just get that and read it over and over and over. And it, it's, and it's, it's real short and it's very, very to the point. Because she just describes that whole soil food web and what it takes to look after it. So back to where I, where I realized I needed to be and, and still am. What's my main responsibility? my main focus as a land steward, a farmer, whatever you want to call it. It's to create 
the best habitat possible for the soil food web for all that life. That's really my only job. And then whatever produce I get out of that is whatever produce I get out of that. I don't have to start. Gosh, that, that takes me to somewhere where I don't particularly want to go, but we need to, really. Finances. There's that financial reality that says, okay, I've either got to buy the land or I've got to lease the land and I have to pay this much for this and this much for that. And so I need to make this much money in order to take care of all that. And I need to make enough money to, to keep my family going and to pay the bills and all that. Now, nature doesn't work like that. <laughs> nature doesn't care about all that. Nature says, look after me and you'll get what you get. <laughs> and, and so, so many people end up in this situation where they're just too caught up in all that to, to take care of the soil food web because it, it's all about that. And to me, that's one of the great sadnesses of, of, of our time is that so many people who are wanting to look after the land are caught in this little boundary thing. Okay, I've only got this much. And it, it ends up being um, on a lot of places, basically the, the, the land is ruined because somebody is just trapped into this small space because of finances. Whereas in reality, there's lots of land, you know, and there's, isn't there? There's lots and lots and lots of land. Mm -hmm. and, there's, and there's this very dysfunctional dynamic going on between the financial world and nature, because nature says, hey, this is not negotiable. <laughs> it's not negotiable. There's a, there's a way to really look after it. And then there's the cheaper way, right? This, this way over here is generally more expensive, and more time consuming in the beginning. Over here, take for example, does, I, does anybody know about the gyro track that Mike Krause has? Mm -hmm. who, who, who's, who's aware of what the gyro track is? One, two, three, very few people. Gyro track is the alternative to bulldozer. Once it has been bulldozed in the past, you don't have to bulldoze it again because the gyro track grinds everything up. It's like a bulldozer, on a, instead of a blade on the front, it has a big hammer mill that just grinds everything up. Even the rocks, if you put on them thick teeth. So, I've talked to a, quite a number of people who bulldoze land in Pune, even people who are aware of the gyro track. But the gyro track costs three times as much so, after six or seven years of fallow, in some places, where the, the, the albizias and the malochias and the cecropias uh, have all produced this beautiful soil down below, they've produced this magnificent soil food web that's ready to really help with the crop growing. <laughs> what happens? They're scraped away. It gets all scraped away. And the sun shines in on the little bit that's left, because most of it's in those berms, right? The sun shines on the little bit that's left and kills most of that. And, the, and there's only one reason to do it. What is it? What? It's Access. easier, it's cheaper. It's yeah. cheaper. Yes, <laughs> the land gets ruined because it's cheaper to ruin it than it is to look at it. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's like, no, no. I mean, there's, there's this really nice guy that I know who's, who's been a farmer all his life on the mainland of here. He owns his own D9, and he was bulldozing 60 acres of um, lime and land that was like I described, it had already grown this forest. And he was even aware of the dry track, and he was aware that it would be way better to do it. But he owns his own bulldozer. So he can bulldoze it for really cheap. 
Whereas if he hired Mike Krause to come with the drive truck, it cost him four times as much. So he just bulldozes all the fertility off and says, we, we're using chemical fertilizer, we don't need that. Right? There's, there's, there's a statistic that was put out years ago, and it's still valid, um, that we import, what, 85% of the food? Of, is that nine or something? I think it's eight, between 85 to 90, but let's say 85. We, we import that much food. 15% or less food is grown here. There's a statistic that's never written down, though. You never see it in the newspaper, you never see it in the articles. What percentage of that 15% of food that's grown here is grown with imported fertilizer? <clears throat> Almost all of it. Almost all of it, whether it's organic or not, it's, it's reliant on imported fertilizer. So really, the whole food supply pretty much is, is relying on imported fertilizer. Which brings us right back around to what does it really take to, to produce soil fertile enough to not need that? Oh. Who here is actually actively farming? Quite a few. <coughs> Where, um, is anybody farming without any fertilizer? Mm. No food. Um, nothing but, you know, just what we make. Uh -huh. You don't buy anything to make it with? Chicken manure. Chicken manure. Very little. I have a chicken manure. It's pretty much just malt, you know, it's just we're doing what you're doing. Yeah, but I, I, I use, I buy the um, ground up dried waste from the fish processing, mm -hmm. fish processing plant on the water. Mm -hmm. Um, it's, is it, anybody else use yeah, I, that? I get that from Josiah. Yeah, from Josiah. Yeah. And what Josiah tells me is that the majority of that is being sent to the mainland for pet food. Oh, because that's nobody, bad. Because all, the majority of the farmers over here are using chemical fertilizers or they're using more sort of tested, known, imported organic fertilizers from the mainland. So. So this really great local fertilizer is being sent to the mainland to, for pet food. And I've been successfully using that for several years now. And it's, it's from a while. Now, I'd really like to get away from that. And why is that? Why, why, is, why is it not really viable to do that? There's lots of reasons. It, it relies on overfishing, probably. And it has to be transported from Oahu to over here. But uh, even more importantly, there isn't enough. Right? And you've got to be happy to use it. It can imbalance. Say again? It can imbalance your soil. I'll it's bet it very, can. It's very strong. Yes, if you use it too much. I use it very sparingly. Yeah. Yeah. As long as you've got a lot of organic matter and you use it sparingly, it seems to be okay. But if you used it, if you overused it, and weren't providing enough organic matter could be a real problem. I think it would encourage pathogenic fungi and other problems. In the wetland tower system, we use about a pound per thousand square. Say again? In the wetland logging system, yeah. we use about a pound for like a thousand square feet. Wow, that's not very much. Is our um, yeah, I mean, I'm originally from Oahu, so I used to farm on Oahu, so most of my information comes from older farmers on Oahu, so the raccoons on Oahu is who kind of gave me their stuff, and I was using that solely in my patches, and they seem to, whatever the kalo needs in, in its life cycle, it, the fishing motion seems to give that out at, just the right time. I didn't fertilize with anything else. It's, it's not emulsion, though. This, this stuff I use is a dry powder. That's what we called it. Okay. Emulsion. But we went through right. Campbell's and got our trucks filled up with right, got it. powder. But, right. I mean, that's, that's a pound for a thousand square feet? That's pretty light. That's, and that's what I pretty much did with 
So we pretty much did with everything. Mm -hmm. Just as a reference. Yeah, yeah. So, so, but the but the main thing is 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 to to get away from that, to not need any anything from the outside, and how how does that happen? I I think animals have got to be involved to to make it really efficient like that. The project that I'm wanting to do, the, the reason I don't have animals on my 20 acres is not big enough, because I'd like to get involved with somebody who has a herd of cattle that we could manage through mob grazing. But we need several hundred acres for that. You, you start to do cattle on 22 acres and there's just not enough room. You run out of grass, so they're in the way. I want to harvest mulch, you know. Get out of here. <laughs> they're in the way. The fencing's in the way or whatever. So I don't want to get into too much of that detail right now, but, um, because more, this, this is, to me this is more about engaging with what the possibilities are and, and what the focus is. So, so let's just bring it back to, as a land steward, a farmer, somebody who's looking after the, the land, it's all about creating that habitat for the life, however we, however we can do that. And what I've experienced over the years is that if I want to do, if I want to look after the land within the borders of the land, which I don't right now, I just admit it, I get stuff from a water, and that's all I use. Um, but at the same time, I need organic matter, and I don't buy any organic matter, I don't get any organic matter from off the farm. So I've got 22 acres, and 18 acres is devoted to elephant grass, and has been since 97. So we're, we're, we're at 18 years now. And uh, this, actually, time to look at this. There we go. There's, uh, we can just pass this around. There's a newspaper in the bottom, so it's not going to come out. This is, this is the elephant grass soil. The, okay, here's the scene. The land was bulldozed for the third time. 97. What I'm farming, anybody know Richard Ha? Yeah. Yeah. Love him. Well, Richard Ha started on the land that I'm working. He, Richard Ha started in 75, down where I live, and he bulldozed the, the virgin forest. Well, he had it bulldozed, and he started a banana farm down there. And then it was, grew up to weed trees, it was bulldozed again, got papayas, and it grew up to weed trees oh, yeah. again. And then it was bulldozed, and I got to use it. So it was <coughs> bulldozed to where you know what it looks like. It's all you can, it's all rocks with a little bit of soil in between, cinder soil. But basically, it's just this level area of rocks with the soil in. So it's really easy for me to, to to see the depth of the soil that's been created since then, because it's right over that bulldozed land. And this this soil has been created since '97. It's three to four inches deep over that whole 22 acres. And the only thing that happened was that the elephant grass, grass got mowed down to itself or harvested for mulch, because I swap from half the farm to half the farm like that. Like there's nine acres over here, there's nine acres over here. In March, I'll harvest this for mulch and I'll mow this to itself with the brush hog. Next year, I'll harvest this for mulch and mow this one down. So this three to four inches of this soil got built over top of that bulldozing simply by doing that once a year. And this is, this is important because it relates to financing and, and the um, efficiency of it. Because with my 80 horse tractor and the brush hog, I can do 10 acres in a day of one-year-old, fully mature, woody elephant grass. That's one year, six feet or something? Six feet? <coughs> 16 know. feet. 16 feet. <laughs> I don't know how that's no, no, <coughs> Fully mature, it's starting to fall over. Mm -hmm. um, it's woody. Uh, and anyway, it's, it's, it's just one of those realizations that I had as I went along, and a little bit of reading. 
Anybody know what root cycling is? <clears throat> like when roots grow and die back? And die, yeah. yeah. The, the tall grasses, the, the elephant grass and several others, the tall grass prairie in, North, in, in the U.S., the original tall grass prairie grew about this high. And they, that's a tall grass. The elephant grass is bigger, it's tropical. But tall grasses, when they're eaten or trampled or rolled or mowed, basically once they're pushed down and they die, the roots die. The roots die and make soil. And then, and then it grows again from a little, I forget what they call it, there's a hard little sort of <coughs> kernel of life down in there. Rhizome. It's not really a rhizome, there's something else. But it grows a new plant, that's what the elephant grass does. And then it makes new roots in amongst all those roots that are dying. So it's making soil with the roots, root cycling, and it's making soil with whatever's growing up and being mowed down. So even when I harvest it with my machine and, and for mulch, because that's why I grow it, right? I got a machine in the back of the tractor that grinds it up and shoots it into a 13-yard trailer, dump trailer. Wow. And then I dump it and it gets hot. So it cooks all the nodes so it doesn't grow again because it gets hot in the pile. But, the, but what we're really talking about is soil building, the root cycling. So even when I take all the top stuff, it's still making soil from the root cycling. So, and, and, then, and then the next year, I don't take <coughs> top. So that's what it built. It, it built between three and four inches of this. And Over how what we, long? What? Over how long? 18 years. Uh -huh. And uh, this is, uh, I mean, it's kind of boring. It's, it's what the elephant grass mulch looks like when it's not broken down. So that's what we're growing the taro in and, and then and all the other crops, the ginger and the turmeric and the, a lot of taro. I mean, I really wish I had some pictures of it right now, but I don't. Right now, there's a taro patch at home at the farm that's um, Lehua and um, Palawan, but the Lehua especially, is about a foot over my head. Wow. And the corms are going to be like five pounds, and there's 1,500 of them. <laughs> and it's growing, it's growing in this three to four inches with a mulch over the top of it, and then a light sprinkling of the, of the fish stuff. Without that, <laughs> it wouldn't be up here. <laughs> It'd be like this. So, um, it's just a, a good example of how to build soil on that rocky Puna land. Because my project is, is to show that the marginal land can be used to grow all the food. Because the really good land is generally held by um, people who've had it for a long time. And they're not letting it go. Whereas there's a lot of marginal land that's, that's really rocky. And the elephant grass will build that soil with them. Um, let's get back to that statistic that I was saying earlier. One day for 10 acres, right? One day per year with the tractor, we'll, we'll mow down 10 acres. So after t let's say after 10 years, you, you, you've got, say, three inches of soil especially if you were doing a cattle thing with it as well, because that would build the soil better. That's pretty good. That's 10 days. 10 days work in 10 years to, to, to grow enough quality soil to grow crops on. Does anybody think that's pretty good? Yeah. That's, that's, that's pretty efficient, right? Oh, I'd say so. 10 days work in 10 years. And, 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 what, and what's, what's the downside of that? Why isn't it being done? Except by crazy people like me. We need a lot of space. How do you get a lot of space? A lot. You have to pay for it, yeah. right? Who, who's going who's gonna to just leave the land like that for 10 years or 18 years? Equipment. Hmm? Equipment. Yeah, which is money again. Mm -hmm. So it, it was only... <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>
Don't don't go there. Uh, 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 I I don't want to go there. Well then go there. Yeah, you know, it was really hard on my marriage, really hard, because 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 I got the calling to do this thing, and it wasn't making money, mm -hmm. and and I subsidized it with all kinds of other things, and I got a big wood shop and whatever, but still, it's a tough thing. To go, okay, <clears throat> I'm gonna do this. <laughs> it must be crazy. <laughs> what do you wanna do that for? Anyway, um, questions. Ask me a question. So, um, you have your, you, you said your farm is 22 acres, is that right? It's a leased farm, I wish it wasn't mine. Well, the farm that you, the land that you farm is 22 yeah. acres, and right. so you have, um, 18 of those acres you're growing the grass on. The elven grass, yeah. Do you rotate your other four acres? Like, the four acres that you're farming, does that, like, rotate through your whole farm or do you farm, like, these four it acres? and through the whole thing. Okay, uh, so how does your... I'm just wondering, like, the... I'll, I'll tell you. Kind of the nuts and bolts of how your yeah, rotation yeah. works. Good, good question. The, there's one area where the old berm was. When, when Richard Hall had it bulldozed, they built a big berm right down the middle. So there was just this huge pile of old forest and rocks and soil. <clears throat> and uh, when I had it bulldozed, I had that leveled out. So it's about 40, 50 feet wide. And that area, I keep pretty much elephant grass free and, and do different things on that, like different rotations. But mainly, it's all elephant grass. And when I wanted, I, I've been growing taro on the farm since, 2007, so, you know, eight years. Um, and we've never grown the taro in the same place. It, it, it's been, I, grew, I do about five crops a year, and it's always been in a different, different place. We, we still haven't got back to the, where we first grew it. <clears throat> what I do is I grind up the elephant grass <coughs> with the tractor, and just really grind it up to where it's all fine mulch like that. And then we put weed mat over it, which is again not sustainable. It's a, it's trash. It's expensive. When it wears out, it's 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 landfill. So it's like mm. the animals need to do that, but I'm not there yet. It's so so as an interim measure, it's worked really well. I buy the high quality weed mat from Rudy Shade, and, and I generally do an area that's 150 feet long and about. 60 feet wide, and we, we move that once every two months. It kills the elephant grass completely in two months. That's the nice thing about elephant grass. It's really sensitive. It's, it's, it's an incredibly sensitive plant. You, you, you can kill it with animals in six months. They, they, they like it so much, mm -hmm. they lead it when it's this big. And remember the root cycling? It, it doesn't have all those roots, they all died. So it's trying to make new roots, and they come and eat it when it's this big. So the elephant grass gets killed really easily by animals. The weed mat kills it in two months. So then we just grind another area up, move the weed mat, and then we just start planting the collar right in there, down into that soil underneath the mulch. And then when I, when I have enough mulch, I can put extra on there. But that's what goes on. So the taro patch just keeps moving around the... Um, and then it just goes back to elephant grass. So it'll take you like 14 years or something like that to make a full rotation at your farm? Yeah, at the taro? yeah at least. Okay. <laughs> nice. Yeah. Yeah. So, so the taro is always on new ground. Right. We're never dealing with leftover diseases or, you know, you guys are nodding. So you see that. It's, it's like you're, not, you're, not, you're never dealing with this having to grow crops on the same piece of land, you know? So, so any sort of leftover disease problems, they're left back in the elephant grass and you, you're moving on. It, it works really well. Um, Question? So you said you harvest the one half for mulch, half of your field for mulch. Mm -hmm. Do you put that around trees or do you, what do you do with it? it? It gets used for the ginger, the turmeric, the pineapples, and if, and if I can, for some taro. Okay. This year, um, I actually, I actually put a bunch of mulch just over on a 
big tarot patch, knowing that I was going to grow ginger there next year. Yeah. So I was building the soil ready for that. So how deep do you do the mulch? Um, it depends. If, if it's on a place where the, the, there's really not, where we just ground at the elephant grass, and uh, good question. Let's, let's, let's back up a little bit. Um, what, what drives, what, what criteria, what, what need drives how much the depth of mulch is? Right? Because why do we mulch? There's habitat, we've already said that, right? right. The habitat for the life. What's another reason to mulch? Reduce the weedings. <laughs> Suppress weeds. Yeah. Suppress weeds, yes. Another reason? Moisture. Moisture, moisture retention. Another one? Uh, erosion control. And not so much where I am. Okay. Could be. Could be. Um, temperature control. Yeah. You, you don't have to import it. <laughs> well, yeah. If, if you, but hardly anybody's growing their own mulch. Right. I I'm not quite understanding what you mean. He needs import it from the mainland. Yeah, it's oh, not yeah, but, but I, I was just looking for reasons to use mulch oh, yeah. rather than you know, where it's from. So yeah, we've got temperature control, moisture retention, habitat, and... Um, Adds carbon. The sun off, and, and, and to keep, keep the sun off, right? Mm -hmm. but, then, but the one that determines how much we use is what you said. Adds carbon. No, it's the weed. Weed oh, the suppression. weed suppression, yeah. Weed suppression determines how much you use. Because in order to, to maintain moisture, you, you, you could get away with this, maybe. And, and to keep the sun off, you could get away with that. Yeah. And to whatever else. But to suppress weed, uh -uh. <laughs> it's like <laughs> up here. And, and the weed suppression is what's needed, right? Because I. I can't. I don't let myself use herbicide. I wish I could, but I can't. Can, <laughs> I have this. I have this theory about about uh, people who, who use chemical fertilizers, and not that I'm saying they're bad people. Don't get me wrong here. Everybody's a good person in my world. But if you, if you're into the chemical fertilizers and you're into the chemical weed killing, the herbicides, if they had to choose, that they had to give up one of those, which would they choose? And I have this little pet theory, they, they'd hang on to their herbicide really tight. And, and they'd, go, <laughs> they'd be like, oh, I could get some fertilizer from somewhere else, but you're not taking my Roundup away from me. Uh-uh-uh. No, 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 no. Because I know what we have to do if I don't have it. And it's like, I don't want to do that again. And that's what a lot of me and my crew spend our time doing. Weeding. It's, well, <laughs> can you imagine what it's like? Well, you probably can. Who, who has to deal with pigs? Oh, Wild pigs. pigs. Who, who has a perimeter fence? <laughs> you have a perimeter fence that works well? Anybody else? Got a perimeter fence? Oh, yeah. Perimeter fence. Perimeter fence. All the way. Right. I don't have a perimeter fence. I got 22 acres of leashed property. I can't afford to do it. So I have to do temporary fences around the tarot patches and the, you know, all the crops. Electric? No. <laughs> Electric? Hey, it works for some people. Well, yeah, but, but it, you need manicured land for that. It, anyway, so, so the, the whole weed thing around the temporary fencing is like, what a nightmare. Let's not get into it. Let's not talk about pigs or fire ants. Thank you. <laughs> God. We won't talk about that. So um, that was a good question about the mulch. Right. Now, I'd like to get move into a whole different um, arena. Because right now we, we've, we've talked mostly about what I call grass culture. Right? Where grass, you, you, you're, you're involved in grass culture. Grass is by far the main ingredient for mulch, organic matter, and animal food. So that's what I call grass culture. And then there's tree culture, where trees are the main 
by far the main source of organic matter and uh, mulch and animal food. Tree culture lends itself to goats uh, as, as far as feeding them. And uh, I really like mulching with whole, you know, 20 foot Malochia, Cecropia, Albizia, whatever, and doing a deep three foot mulch <laughs> around. Well, uh, I love it. I it's love extremely it. coarse, <clears throat> right? If you did a three foot deep mulch of elephant grass mulch, what would happen at the bottom? And I wrote it for a way. And dry. <laughs> I mean, it'd be terrible, you know, because the bottom would just be. Ugh. Whereas a three foot deep mulch of 20 foot long or whatever just sticks, coarse, coarse sticks. The rain and the air mm -hmm. go straight down. So the, so the bottom of that, you talk about the soil food web. Imagine what's going on down at the bottom of that stick pile. And I, I've done years and years and years of experiments with this. And if I have Hono Hono and Glycine growing as a cover crop, which tends to be the default in my area, if you kind of don't do much weeding or weed killing, it tends to go to Hono Hono and Glycine. The glycine's the vine that will grow on the fruit trees and kill them. Which is, I, I love glycine. Glycine's like, yes. And elephant grass, yes. Albizia, yes. All these things that are called problems. Have you, has anybody heard of anybody saying that is a problem? No? is <laughs> not a problem. is an incredible resource. It just needs to be in the right place. And, and elephant grass too and all that. So anyway, if, if there's glycine and hono hono and you, grow, and you throw these sticks down, nice and thick, then what happens? It grow over it. It just grows back through it. And it grows a roof over the top of it, which creates what we said earlier. The sun's not shining on, on all those sticks. It's dark in there. The, the temperature's pretty ambient. So can you imagine what starts to go on in that pile of sticks? What? The soil food web. It's just, man, it's just teeming there. You get down in there and have a look, and it's just incredible. And... and uh, Where's um, Zach? Can you go? He just stepped outside. Oh, yeah. Zach and I were talking about this earlier. Um, <clears throat> one of the things missing in a lot of modern farming is a substance called lignin. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Anybody know anything? What's lignin? It's a development of a cell as it gets woody. Woody. Yeah. Yeah. Woody and yeah, hard and woody, stiff, shiny. Mm hmm. It's, it, it's, there's a good example of that. So, if, you, if you're dealing with greenery all the time, like if you're growing um, uh, green manure crops that are, um, that are just soft and green, so the only organic matter going onto the ground is soft and green, then you gradually lose all your lignin. And the, the lignin in elephant grass is in this outer layer. It's, it's shiny. It reflects the light. It has that sort of um, shiny, waxy coating on it, which um, ironically is a, fun it's a, fung a fungicide. Lignin's kind of a fungicide. Lignin's really hard to break down. And the, there aren't many fungi that will do it. And the fungi that we really want are the ones that will break down lignin. So if you have, if the land is really low in lignin, it favors the fungi that we don't really want. Whereas if the land has plenty of lignin in it, it gradually builds up the, the fungi that we like. Why is that? Hmm? Why is that? Why, why is, why is lignin selected that? Is it, is it because the fungi that we don't like cannot eat lignin. Yeah. So, and the fungi that we do like eat lignin, they break it down. So the more lignin there is, the more of those ones are up. 
with, without them, then, then they're not there because they, they don't have their food. And so, and so the pathogenic fungi start to take over. Like if you have a room full of vegetarians and all you serve is beef, they'll all leave and meat will show up. <laughs> <laughs> so, Thank so, you for that, Kyle. Yeah. So when you pass this Human around, <laughs> when, when you pass this around, th this is the semi-broken down mulch. So all the little black stuff in there is mostly millipede poop and uh, very various other. So that's the cellulose. It's, it's the cellulose and the green leaves that have broken down, and what's left is the lignified pieces that, that haven't broken down yet. So there you go. So back to the stick mulch. The, the, this is one of my favorite things. It is, when, I do, um, when I do consulting for people who um, are wanting to either change their land or they're starting off, um, I tell them, okay, if you want to do, if you want to really keep it, so that you don't have to keep buying dump truck loads of stuff all the time, you're going to have to dedicate at least 50% of your land to growing organic matter. And they just look at me like, what? <laughs> yeah. And I and I said, at least 50%. That's the bare minimum. Better off going 60, 70 in favor of growing organic matter to, to, to feed the crops. And uh, it's just the reality of it, especially in Pune, where, where we, we, we it's just got so much rocky soil. And then there's the other one. And I have yet to see an orchard where the trees are planted far enough apart. Yeah. I've never seen one yet, Not yet. Except, except for the small one that I've got going. I'm, I'm planning a 60-acre one that I've just got the lease on where I want to demonstrate the four trees per acre. If you're doing citrus or avocado, breadfruit, three trees per acre. Because well over half the acres to grow the, the organic matter to put on the trees. Because in Pune, there is no down. We don't have down. We've only got sideways for tree roots. We don't have down. You've got to be kidding. It's about that deep. And then it's blue rock. There's no down. So I, I, did, I did a lot of investigation into uh, dwarf citrus. I, I have a dwarf Myers lemon at home. And here's a good, good example. Right here. Say, say the trunk of the, of the lemons right here. Here's the trunk. The tree's 20 feet in diameter. It's 20 years old. It's 10 feet high and 20 feet wide. Wow. And, and the rule of thumb about the health of, of something like that, especially the dwarf citrus, is that you must not be able to see into it at all. If you can see into it, it's not getting near enough food. You, you shouldn't be able to see in. It should just all be leaves and fruit all the way to the ground. There's no way you can see it. And, and, and I go to so many orchards, and you can see all the branches, with the lichen growing on them, and, and it's, it's really, it's like, whoa. Anyway, so we go, one, two, three. So, so there's the trunk, and here's the edge of the tree, and then we've got, so right around where you guys are sitting, is, when you dig in the ground, yeah. is this massive, this, this mat of lemon roots yeah. that, that are feeding, and, and they're like this. They're feeding 20 feet from the drip line. So, do the math. If you don't want that tree to compete with another tree, especially in Pune on rocky soil, you get into drought, right? What's the math? 40. 10 feet, and then 20, that's 30. So if those trees are 60 feet apart, then those roots are just starting to overlap. Wow. And if you do a three-foot stick mulch on that whole thing with hono hono and glycine going on, then that tree is so healthy and so crazy abundant that it'll, it'll produce 2,000 pounds of lemons a year, or oranges, or tangelos, or whatever. Or a full-size tangelo tree, 3,000. Oh, yeah. 4,000. That's what I want. Yeah. So, 
and, and you're not giving any fertilizer, you're just providing that habitat. And this is, nobody wants to even go near it. They want a lawn. They do. Everybody wants a lawn. And, and, and they want the trees way closer together. And so the tree roots are feeding underneath the next tree where there's nothing going on. And it's, now, don't get me wrong here. I'm not saying that you can't do it any other way. I'm just saying it's amazing to see the, the health and vitality of, of a tree when it's got that going on. Picture that the, the weather's really dry for a few weeks, or maybe even two months, yeah. right? And this, this whole thing, can you picture it? This, this stick mulch that you do once a year, and it's, got the, and it's just big, and this tree sitting in there, and then all of a sudden it rains. It rains six inches or something. You should see what the tree does when it's getting fed from that massive circle. It just goes, it just, ah. Anybody know Arnold Hara? Somebody's got to know Arnold. You do. Arnold Hara, is he still there? Chief entomologist at CETA? He's been chief entomologist at CETA for 25 years. He's the guy who everybody calls when they've got problems. You know, my orchard's got all these problems, and my, my fruit's not very good, and whatever. Uh, Arnold came down about eight, ten years ago, and he, he looked at the lemon tree, which is the one I have with, with this demonstration, and uh, he's looking at it going, wow, this tree's so healthy, and it has every citrus disease that's on the side. <laughs> <laughs> He's looking around it, he's got, it's got this, I can't remember the names of them. He says, he's got this, he's got this, he's got this, yeah. But, but it's all contained, it's all in small quantities, and the tree's handling it, and the tree's, and he says, what do you do? What do you spray on? How are you, con how are you controlling these diseases that are on this tree? And I, I said, I just throw a bunch of sticks around it. <laughs> <laughs> and he goes, come on, you know. You just, you're kidding me, right? I said, no, I, I just throw a whole bunch of sticks, like truckloads, around this one tree. And, and he's like, wow, it works, because it's got it all, but, but none of it's affecting the tree. Um, so I live in Honolulu, and we have nice deep soil, but it's all depleted and stuff, right? Um, there's a lot of grass, and it, like, so... It, I feel like if I throw all the sticks on there, the grass is just going to grow right through the sticks, and then I just got a pile of sticks I got to lose. What, <laughs> what kind of grass? Guinea all, grass. Probably every invasive grass. Well, well, if it's the tall grasses, you have to get rid of them first. Yeah. Like the sticks, the sticks and the hona hona and glycine will kill all the short grasses. Okay. All of them. You know, e even pangola is short enough that, that it'll get rid of them. You know, and, it, it, and it'll even suppress Wainaku because Wainaku is not a tall grass, right. but it has that nasty right. underground thing. But that's not, it's not going to get any light. Okay. Whereas the guinea grass and the elephant grass, you've really got to get rid of it first because it'll grow straight through the sticks. Yeah. It'll love it. So, so I never do a stick mulch on elephant grass. I don't have guinea grass. Same, same problem though. Yeah, yeah. So once you've got rid of the tall grass, you, you, you can take... Um, a lawn of short grasses, whether it's a close mowed lawn or you know whatever, and and you can kill the whole thing with with the stick mulch. Yeah. yeah. Especially if you plant, if you throw down hona hona and glycine first and put sticks on top of it because it will grow up through it, and then create that roof on it. So I just gotta take the root ball and tall grasses out first. No, no, you no, you cut it and we weed mat it. Because it's way too much work to dig them out. Yeah. I've, I've seen people trying to yeah. dig out acres of elephant grass, or not acres, but whatever. It's like, you must be kidding. Two months with elephant grass with the weed mat. Guinea grass now? Yeah. Maybe months. six months. Yeah. What? Three at least. Oh, I, I would go. If longer. it's dry, you can. It depends on, like, if it's dry, yeah. it dies faster. If it's wet, it dies slower. Well, well you'll find out. I mean, <laughs> 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 
<laughs> but, but with the elephant grass, <laughs> I've been doing it for years. It. It's two months. So you cut the elephant grass, you put it on top, and then you put the weed mat on that. Or you just put the weed mat straight you on You just the grind up all the, the tall grass, whether it's skinny grass or elephant grass, yeah. just grind it up, put the weed mat down, make sure you overlap it good and weigh it down good. And with elephant grass in two months, it'll be dead. With guinea grass, you'll have to experiment. I don't have that. I think guinea grass can take longer. It depends on probably like being on soil versus being on rock. It probably right. dies slower on soil than it does on rock. So, so this, this is my <laughs> gets into your mind. This is a really good point we're at because remember the the weed mat is not sustainable. The weed mat's not regenerative. The weed mat's a, a, a stopgap <coughs> compromise, right? As is the fertilizer from the water. It's just a compromise to get things going. So I'm not just going to do nothing, because right? I'm not ready to do the cattle thing yet. But the way to kill elephant grass and guinea grass is with animals, because they like it. Right. You make dog like just that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, it's going to hurt dogs out there. <laughs> so eventually, eventually anybody who's really serious about regenerative is, is that you kill the tall grasses with the animals. Right, and, and as the animals, and you, anybody who, who who does cattle here besides Mike? Anybody? So so you guys are very well aware that the cattle or horses, you know, any ungulate is going to kill the tall grasses. They don't let them live, right? You never have tall grasses in the past. No. It's always the short grasses. So so with animals, with animals you can control the tall grasses, kill them. It'll all get taken over with short grasses, and then you can do a stick mulch. Okay. Because the stick mulch will kill the short grasses. Because grass is, grass belongs by itself. No, no matter what size it is, grass belongs by itself. Not with fruit trees, not with crops. Anybody who's got crops, you don't want grass, right? In your crops. It's like grass is vigorous and it, and it takes over. You know? and, and grass is wonderful by itself. <laughs> right? In the pasture, in, in, in the mulch field, you know, but not around the crops. Now, a little bit of grass around the fruit tree where you walk, that's inevitable. This, this system that I'm talking about with the sticks obviously requires walkways, right? So, so you have a walkway around the tree, because it's still arterial roots at that point. You don't need to feed it right up to the drip line. So, so there's places to walk, and that'll obviously be grass, but underneath the sticks it won't. Um, <laughs> I go to places where still, even when people have been told, they're feeding their fruit trees underneath the tree. Underneath the tree. They, they're putting mulch and fertilizer underneath the tree. It's like, you start several feet from the drip line and feed them out here, right? You feed them out beyond the drip line. And there's a real obvious reason that people don't want to do that. Pi R squared. Maybe yes, it's larger. It's huge. <coughs> it's, 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 there's so little area under the tree, it doesn't take much. <laughs> Just a little, it doesn't cost much. You start to try and feed a tree properly, then all of a sudden you, you got ten times the area. So, rather than go on much more, I think you got it. it it's, it's about habitat. It's about, are, are we prepared, are any of us prepared to really create the habitat? Now, Korean natural farming inputs. Wonderful. Absolutely wonderful. I would love it if they were on my farm, but I don't have time. And somebody else, I, I'm always offering it to people. Hey, you want to do the Korean inputs for the farm? Yeah, I don't think so. <laughs> Someday. <laughs> but the key to me, to, the key to all those inputs is habitat. If you, if you go to all that trouble to make all that stuff and put it somewhere where it's going to thrive, not somewhere where it's going to need it again next week, that's my thing with it. 
you're, 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 you're making a concentrate of microorganisms, then I want to see it put where it's going to thrive and multiply, not somewhere where it's going to die. So that's my thing about that. And this, this, there's a lot of ways to do that, but basically you've got to get it down in that area where the temperature's constant, it's dark, it's moist, you know, all that stuff we talked about earlier. How do you make your stick mulch and what's your preferred stock? The stick mulch? Yeah. Anything that's easy to cut. Okay. Just talk to the guy with the machete and say, what do you like? Well, supply, <laughs> you're actually doing current natural farming. Current natural farming is very dry. And you're doing it in a different way. You're creating a habitat for the fungi. Well, that's what only. current natural farming does, you know, and you're just doing it, you have the, 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 the right setting to do all of this, and it's, it's perfect. And, and this is what we're all trying to do. People live in different places, you do different things, but you're doing it perfectly. You're creating a habitat. For, for the indigenous microorganisms. Yeah, because the indigenous. They're already there. Yeah, they're already there. <laughs> and, and, and the land hasn't seen the sun for 17 years yeah. since it was born. Right. So the, the sun hasn't shone on the soil. So they must be there. Yeah. Right? So, you know, and also, where you are, you've got the elder grass, and it grows really good there. But you know, places like the Hamakura, what I've been doing lately, that I've fallen in love with, is the Glucidia tree and the Pigeon Pea. Yeah. It's the same thing. The Glucidia and the Pigeon Pea, they make shade, they make nitrogen, and if you dig underneath, you'll find that the same thing is going on. You can cut it down, you can make sticks. I use those too. Huh? I use the Glucidia and the Pigeon Pea. Oh, you got them right on. Oh, yeah. Oh, for sure. I, I love them both. Uh -huh. Pigeon pea, I found, is it's hard to it's hard to get consistent propagation. Sometimes it seems to do really well, and sometimes it doesn't. Clear city and now pretty much all of it does. Yeah. <clears throat> it's it's become, easy. You stick it in the ground. Right. For stick mulch, it's perfect. Yeah. <laughs> and goat food, too. Stick mulch, goat food, same thing, right? <laughs> 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 because, well, it, you, you, you imagine this scene that I've just described, right? The scene that I just described has hono hono and glycine, right? Which is green, wet, you know, soft material, right? So it doesn't need tree leaves. It just needs sticks. It doesn't need the leaves, because it's got the hono hono and the glycine. So the leaves can all go to the goats. The leaves of the of the the um, Albizia and the Cecropia, the Malochia, the, the Glucidia. The goats can have all the leaves and the trees get the sticks. Another, another plant that really loves stick mulch is the plantains. Did anybody get any of the yellow plantains into pudding? So good. Yeah. Very good. I'll be there. But, so plantains, did anybody know where plantains originated? Uh, South, South America? America. South, Northern South America. Right, <coughs> the plantains were 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 the one of the main crops of the slash and burn. Ten thousand years of slash and burn. You carry the plantains and you plant them on the manioc, right, the tapioca. So the plantains were always moving, always moving, and I, and I think it got into their DNA because 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 my my plantains really like to be moved. They don't like to sit in the same place like apple bananas and and the other, you know, Cavendish or whatever. <coughs> Plantains like to, they, once they're in the same place for a few years, they kind of go, eh, I'm tired, let's, can, can we go? <laughs> so, and, and also they have a tendency to fall over, the, the plantains. So imagine what a three to four foot deep stick mulch does around the plantains. One, it, they lean against it. That's why you don't cut it into small bits. You leave, them, you leave them 20 feet long and you get them all interlaced and then the plantains go like this they kind of lean on them and they don't fall over plus the pigs won't go in there mm -hmm. the pigs don't like that that mass of sticks so they don't go in and dig around the, around the bananas anyway I think, I think that's enough I, it's, it's, <laughs> the worst thing to do is go on too long have I gone on too long? no, no. okay good well now's the time to get off then <laughs> Unless there's more questions.
Let's, let's, let's just question. Just your um, piece of equipment that's uh, as a flail mower? It's called a, a forage harvester. Oh, they use like it for silage. silage, they use it for... Um, and it has a sh it shoots the hay out, and it, I think I saw a video of your... Uh, you probably did on the website? Uh, my friend had it on his camera or something. Oh. Harrison. There's a little, there's a little short video on, the, on my website. Maybe it, he got it, it there. But it, it grinds it up into pieces and then shoots it, it throws it up a chute and, and shoots it into my 13 yard dump trailer. Uh -huh. And it's... Uh, so, what, what, what horsepower is your track? 80. 80, yeah. It's going to be big for that. Well, yeah, I'd love a 160. <laughs> <laughs> with, 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 with four equal size tires. Oh, yeah. The, the, the big ones. No, I want the Ferrari. Mine's tractor. too low. If, if, if I go into a place where the elephant grass is like 10 years old and I'm trying to clean it up for somebody, I can get stopped by the clump because, because my track is too low. But yeah, 80 is just enough. Yeah. The, the forest harvest is only four and a half feet wide. And it'll stop it. It'll stop my tractor if it's real thick. Anyway, um, yeah. Any other questions? All right. Well, I guess we're done. Thank you so much.